Hey, welcome to Lab the Podcast. We get to share time with people whose lives and work express the life and beauty of the gospel. And our conversation today is an important intersection of both of those. I'm grateful to share some time with Sarah Johnson, Florida's statewide grassroots director of Vote No on Flor- for Florida, the political committee organized to defeat the deceptive and extreme abortion amendment on Florida's November ballot. Sarah's worked on campaigns large and small across the state of Florida for more than 15 years and and traveled to Pensacola from Pensacola to Miami, educating voters on Amendment Four. Sarah, we're stealing some time in a pretty busy moment in the election cycle, but thanks for sharing time with us. Yeah, absolutely. We are 32 days away from Election Day as we record this. I don't know what day it'll be posted, but it is down to the wire, and I'm very excited. Yeah, it is. I mean, this is your. This has been a long-term effort for you. For us, there's this kind of rapid acceleration right before the election mm-hmm. cycle. So I know it's busy, and we're grateful to have you. We want to talk a little bit about the specific amendment, but as you said, we're recording this just prior to the vote. And I think what's important is we're going to get into the amendment, but we're also going to talk about an issue that extends beyond just the particular vote. I mentioned it before, but as a religious organization that thinks about life and beauty, we Mm. kind of lead with beauty. We know that beauty draws us to discover what is good and know what is true. And so that's our framework. We get to talk to artists and authors and poets, and we're in this conversation where beauty leads us to goodness and truth. And for us, Romans 1 and Ephesians 2 both use this really interesting language about life and talking about human life and even creation itself as the poetry of God. And so there's this really important intersection that life and dignity are not just beauty, but human life in particular, in our view, is the highest expression of artistry. So that's why conversations about legislation and language anywhere in the sphere of human dignity are important even for our audience, or especially for our audience, because we know that beauty points beyond itself, and there's something about the human person that does that in a way that nothing else can do. So that's why for us, legislation and language are important. I'm curious for you, just background-wise, you have a long history working in politics. What? How did you get involved in Amendment 4? Why was this something that you decided was going to be your aim and focus? Um, yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's I heard someone say when I was uh, pondering a life of politics very early on as a teenager that the essence of all political involvement is love. And I was like, no, that's dumb. I just want to make a difference. And then I realized as he continued to elaborate on that, it, it means that you're motivated by love for your neighbor or belief in something that's bigger than you are. And I was like, oh, I guess that makes sense. I hated to think of myself as this like soft hearted person when I wanted to be a tough political person uh, early on. But that is what really what drove me um, into politics. I was homeschooled growing up and I realized like, man, so I don't want to age myself. But homeschooling was still relatively new. Only about 3% of the population was homeschooled when I was. And of course, it's boomed beyond COVID. So there was still this Uh, kind of scary thought when I was a teenager that homeschooling could be undone. And there were some other things that mattered to me. So I started getting involved in politics. And the fight for life is sort of the issue of our day, regardless of what side of it you're on. And it it is a fight for dignity for both sides, I think. Um, If you are pro-life, you believe that to exist is dignity. And if you're pro-choice, you believe that women should have dignity Um, and their right to choose and and sort of a bodily autonomy. So I think what motivates everyone to work in this is is love um, for love and a belief in dignity. Uh, So we all are coming to the table to do that. What what started me getting involved here is I started on the campaign in January. Uh, Beyond that, I have a background. So so from that time of being a teenager and realizing that uh, we're all motivated by love for something, I I realized uh, I got to work in law for a little bit. So I, I worked in Tallahassee helping to pass laws in the legislative process. 
the policy process. And then I realized, you know, it, you don't have to have a really strong policy arm if you elect the right candidates. So I did the opposite of a lot of people who work in politics. I, I went to Tallahassee and then realized, oh, if I just elect good candidates, I can, this conversation doesn't even have to happen. So um, I started out talking to legislators about how they should vote and then went to to learn how to get them elected, which is the opposite of how most people do it. So I have this sort of foundational background in, in policy work. What are the words that govern us? And then this, the real um, sort of meat of my career has been grassroots advocacy. How do we get voters to understand candidates and issues to vote um, our values uh, when they go into the ballot box? So educating voters versus educating legislators and how do we put people in office or pass issues on in ballot initiatives um, that promote uh, issues that deal with dignity? So, so that's sort of my background. And in January, I was like, oh my goodness, an opportunity to work on a campaign like this as a good mixture of my understanding of policy and then that background in grassroots advocacy as the statewide grassroots director for the Vote and Up campaign. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, it's awesome to hear you say that at the root of it is love. And we talk about this all the time, love willing the good of another. And the way you said that, that of course, that leads us to policy. And if you think about classic virtues in justice and the idea that justice, there's individual justice, community justice, there's a justice that includes me and my neighbor. And mm -hmm. to think well about that. It doesn't just happen. We need people participating in the process. I'm curious, you mentioned the legislative side. So there, uh, you, you touched on a few things that I think are just interesting for us. When we think about love, right? You can think soft, squishy, amorphous, just like, what are we even talking about? But then you get the definition of love, willing the good of another. Mm -hmm. you go, okay, well, there's rigor and structure around that. Well, that's going to mean policy. It's going to mean language about things that we agree on and we're going to commit as a group to act on. We have legislators who are going to represent us in that. We're going to have people in office who are taking those roles and feel called to serve. And then we have a population that get has the privilege of participating in a system that yeah. allows us to have a voice. So really beautiful, right? In theory, mm -hmm. I think on the street right now, just outside of an election, I can say from people that I talk to, there's not a ton of confidence. There's almost a cynicism about the process. And in fact, I've asked so many people who are amazing, really intelligent people. I've said, hey, we need you to run, like participate in writing the laws, running for office, get get involved. And people are just kind of running in the opposite direction and you are leaning into it. So obviously you have confidence in our system of government. Do you, from being on all sides of that, the policy side, the elected official side, and then the grassroots side, Help me, you know, is there an optimistic note that we can strike from the inside where you can say, no, don't give up. Like our system is really beautiful and it is functioning. Absolutely. Um, what's incredible is whenever you work on candidate campaigns. So what I do, I, I'm, what I'm working on now is a constitutional amendment and that uh, you sort of frame this already, but constitutional law, constitutions of states and of the U.S. are the highest governing documents. So for Florida, if we pass the, the current amendment that uh, I'm working against, that's enshrined in our highest governing document. So legislators are subject to that. But when I used to work with candidates, right now I work more with words and issues, but when I used to work with candidates, I was amazed at how much one citizen made a difference when an elected official caught them um, at a, at a um, local community event because it's because the number of involvement is so low right now in communities, uh, one citizen can make a difference. And what's also incredible is that, sure, your congressman does a lot, but your state house and state senate leaders do a lot too. But your city council member who has maybe 12,000 uh 
constituents to answer to, they do a lot for you too. So if there's a tree growing through your sidewalk, well, that's your city council member. But if you can develop a relationship with them, you can um, begin to engage on a local level in a way that you'd be shocked how much of a difference you can make just engaging with municipal government. And then also it's so encouraging when you're an elected official to meet someone who doesn't have a, a motivation beyond just being an encouragement. Uh, so, so that's that's the what I would say is um, the encouragement to citizens who are listening to this and thinking about doing more. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, because I think it's important, even as we start to get into the issue a little bit more and talk about Amendment 4, right. to undergird the entire conversation with confidence mm -hmm. that, A, it matters. And again, for our audience, thinking from like a, a framework of a particular religious view, there's even debate in that community of, does it even matter? Should we even be concerned of this? And yeah. our podcast, our audience, our conversation is deeply incarnational, saying like, no, the whole idea is this embodied love that does reach out and impact the real embodied lives of our neighbors. And our neighbor being anybody who we are living in contact and proximity with, right? Whether they agree with us or don't agree with us, we're to think well and seek their highest good. And there's this beautiful principle of, of shalom, and it, the idea is universal mm -hmm. flourishing and delight. Like, is it possible that we could wrestle with issues and think well about mm -hmm. things so that the outcome may not be what our initial preference was, but when we think well about it and we listen to our neighbor, we go, okay, wow right? Bumpered by good, true, beautiful realities, we come to a thing that may overturn our preference or maybe stretch us or grow us on an issue, but ultimately it leads to a more universal flourishing and delight. And, and so I just appreciate you working in that space. I really applaud you. And I think anybody listening, like, don't give up. We have a beautiful thing and it is working. And I think Sarah's great evidence of that. If Have you learned, and this will put you on the spot maybe, but just in your career in politics, is there something that you've learned just as a person that you will say, hey, in this, I would have never learned this or I would have never been shaped like this had I not participated in this beautiful system in the way that I've had? Is there some lesson that you have taken away from your years in politics that you go, hey, this gave me that gift? Sure. I think um, even the smallest action is a big difference. We were just talking about uh, candidates and, and one example of a difference that one or two citizens can make. Uh, the current Speaker of the House is Paul Renner, and he ran for House the first time in 2014, uh, and he lost. And he lost by two votes. That is the like literal mathematical difference that two people could make. Um, but the beauty of that was that the two years later, he'd, he'd moved to, to a little bit further south in Florida. There was an open seat there. He ran, and because he ran then, he became Speaker of the House today. Um, and because of that, he has, if you believe, um, like I do, that Amendment 4 is bad policy, he's helped, he's given us a million dollars from his political committee that he's raised over the years and raised from people that he knows another million dollars. If he had not been in power at this time, so so it's also this this beauty of like one person makes a difference, but even things that seem like, hey, maybe this isn't the right time. Maybe it's God saying it's not the right time. But it doesn't mean that it's not setting you up for a difference today, um, because in his sphere, he's also been able to encourage other elected officials to stand up and speak out against Amendment 4. But if his term had ended two years earlier, he would be in a different place politically and, and be um, perhaps in a position of less power so he couldn't help us defeat this amendment. And it doesn't matter what your opinions are about this. The lesson there is that two, two people as individuals, um, made a difference in his campaign for the other guy. But him, even in that seeming failure, has been in the right spot here and now today. So I think the other thing that I've learned about, especially in the last year of this campaign, is like, man, the sovereignty of God over all times and seasons is a beautiful gift that I wouldn't have seen if I wasn't involved. Yeah, that's so cool. I, I love that. And 
The other night I was catching just like a small part of the vice presidential debate and J.D. Vance caught me off guard with something. There was a great, I, I thought it was a great respectful dialogue. And, and there was a moment where J.D. Vance said something about if he lost, he would shake hands. Or one of them said, if I lost, I'd shake hands. And then the next day I would get to work trying to help you win. Like in the sense of, you know, sometimes it doesn't fall to our side, but we don't give up. There is an opportunity. And I love this story that even in a loss, some door is opened, we learn something, we come back, it's a process, and there's a sovereignty there that we can trust that participation is part of the process. And so uh, to get away from kind of the win-loss polarization, but to say, no, I'm in there, I'm having the dialogue, I'm contributing. And even if I don't get the nod to lead that effort, I still was a contributor to shaping in some way the conversation. It's just super good. Let's let's turn to Amendment 4 if we can. I want to be respectful yeah. of your time. I know I've only got you for a short time, but can you help us understand first, like a yes, no, and a vote, no amendment? Let's start there because when we talked the other day, it was just helpful for me from your experience to get a little bit of perspective on the way a yes, no vote amendment is written. And you mentioned it before, this would become enshrined law at the highest level uh, of our state government. And so before we talk about the specifics of Amendment 4, just talk about the creation of legislation in this yes-no structure and how that then opens the door for discussing something like the particular nature of Amendment 4. Sure. There are three different ways in Florida that an amendment can get on the ballot. Legislators can do it. We have a constitutional revision commission. Um, but this comes to us by citizens initiative petition, which is a pretty unique process. Uh, um, I think it's less than 20 states have this process where citizens can come together and put something on the, the ballot. But what we've seen is that it's become sort of a money race uh, in collecting petitions. So a group like a political committee comes together and says they get to write it. They get to write the text, the legal text that would go into the Constitution, the ballot summary that's supposed to summarize it for voters on the on the November ballot. Um, a group gets to write that, and then they collect petitions from across the state of Florida. And what you do when you start a yes campaign, a yes citizens initiative, is you write a ballot summary that is sunshine and rainbows and unicorns. It uses big words like freedom and liberty and rights. Um, and in that polls, that amendment polls, um, the highest it'll ever be on the first day that it's seen by voters. Because the general rule of politics is that bad news travels faster than good news. Um, you know this if you have kids. Uh, news travels faster if you're having broccoli for dinner than if you're having brownies for dinner. Right. And that bad news about broccoli, you will hear about for a much longer time than the good news about brownies. So the nature of political campaigns is that if you are a yes campaign, you want to write an amendment that sounds really good, but you want to hide in the in the ballot text, what actually is enshrined in the Constitution, what you really want. Um, so as we get to Amendment 4, that'll make more sense. But this will poll really high uh, every day, and, and every day it'll lose votes until Election Day. Uh, and then the, the nature of a no campaign is to litigate the details. It's to make sure that voters hear and see what's in this amendment. Um, and if it's a bad enough amendment and the voters hear the truth about it, they reject it. Um, now, sometimes no campaigns don't have a lot to work with. Sometimes voters really do love policies. And I'm, I'm curious about what Election Day holds for us. But that's what we are working to do on Amendment 4 is to, to pull back the curtain on what the ballot summary hides, the words that they use, and to tell voters uh, really the truth about this amendment. And hopefully they continue to lose votes until Election Day and we are successful. Uh, one thing about uh, constitutional amendments in the state of Florida is that it's not a 50-50 vote split where the simple majority wins. Uh, yes, campaigns need to get 60% of votes. Uh, so a lot of times these, the first day that they're polled when they're presented to voters, they poll at around 70% and they lose votes all the way until election day. So it's our hope that we are able to push this amendment for um, all the way past way way down below 60%. That's so helpful. Again, for everybody listening, just think about this, right? Go all the way back for our audience, especially life and dignity, life and beauty. 
human life and the human person as the highest artistry of God. This, this, the starting point for us in this conversation is way upstream there. And we go, okay, these are our convictions. And then so it's important to think well about language and legislation anytime we're dealing with that beautiful and sacred thing of life and dignity. So now, great explanation. Because I always wonder when I go vote yes or no, right? On the, there's always that nervousness when you get to the ballot box. You're, even when you've studied really well, it's like the fear of test taking. I go, what if I get this wrong? Like I mark the yes when I should have marked the no, right? So even right. just that education of, hey, a citizen's group wrote this language that's going to get enshrined. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but they wrote the definition that I'm reading about what it means to vote yes or no. So I need to pay attention to the language and really think well about it because it may not necessarily accomplish or prevent what I'm thinking that it's going to accomplish or prevent. So remember, think all the way upstream to your convictions. What do I care about? What matters? And then let's get into the language and legislation of what we're aiming at and know what this process is like. So with that as backdrop, talk about Amendment 4. What, what is it? And why is a no vote on Amendment 4 the right way on this yes-no to be in alignment with what we would say is the conviction that the highest artistry of God, life and dignity, the best way to, to think well and to guard that is a no vote on Amendment 4. Yeah, so the group that came together to form this uh, did it through a political committee called Floridians Protecting Freedom. And their main funders are the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, Planned Parenthood, and the George Soros Funded Open Society Fund. So they got to write uh, whatever they wanted. Now, a, a yes vote takes this language and it enshrines it into the, our constitution, which is the state's highest governing document. A no vote keeps everything the way that it is. Nothing changes if you vote no. We sometimes say that no is not now, but yes is forever. And that's a good way to think more generally about all uh, constitutional amendments. But I have the amendment in front of me and um, the ballot summary reads, no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. This amendment does not change the legislature's constitutional authority to require notification to a parent or guardian before a minor has an abortion. And if it's okay, I'll go ahead and walk through the words of this amendment. Um, I feel a little bit like a pastor who reads a verse a little bit by a little bit. So no law shall, and we'll stop right there. That means no law from the legislature, from the governor, no regulation from the Agency for Healthcare Administration. And what I'll also say is that doesn't mention a time. It doesn't mean no future law. It means no law in existence or in the future to come. No law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion. That word delay always catches my eye because it means we can't even slow down access to an abortion with a law. And here's where it continues, before viability. And this is the first word we find that really needs a definition. Uh, generally speaking, there's uh, viability is when a, a pregnancy, a baby is capable of surviving outside of the womb through common medical care, which is about five and a half months, 24 weeks, um, or the second trimester. But the scariest word in this amendment is the small word that follows that. Because up until now, it sounds like, oh, well, you just have a right to abortion up until viability. But this little word or means even when a pregnancy is viable without prohibition, penalization, delay, or restriction, no law shall do any of those things with abortion when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. And these are two other terms that are not defined in this amendment and don't have a, a common definition in our state statute. And if we do, state law is still subject to the constitution that we enshrine it in. So this patient's health care provider, when I hear that term, I think of someone in a white coat with a stethoscope around their neck, who is my doctor and I'm sitting in an exam room. That's not necessarily who this is. And we don't know who the sponsor wanted this to be because they didn't provide a definition. And then they get to evaluate the patient's health. And when I hear that, I think, oh, we're, we're saving lives, uh, the, the lives of the mom, or protecting her health. But there's no diagnosis required. There's no parameters put in the full text of this amendment for what that is. So no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or 
when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. There are no further definitions in the statute, um, in the in the full text that we would enshrine in our constitution. And the ballot summary has a second sentence that doesn't exist in the full text of the amendment, but it's referenced um, in, in legalese. Uh, this amendment does not change the legislature's constitutional authority to require notification to a parent or guardian before a minor has an abortion. So what that sounds like is, hey, you get to keep parental notification as given to you in the constitution. And that's true, but what it doesn't tell you in this ballot summary written by the sponsors is that right now in state law, which is a lower body of law, we have a robust right to parental consent prior to a minor's abortion. So if we enshrine this in our constitution, we keep notification, sure, because they can't take that away with this constitutional amendment. But parents lose the right to consent prior to their minor's abortion. It's the difference between finding out your daughter is going to have an abortion and being asked whether she that procedure can be performed on her or not. So the way that it's worded is deceptive. And this would actually make abortion the only medical procedure that could be performed on a minor in Florida without her parents' permission. Mm -hmm. um, so it's those are the words of the amendment. Yeah. Thank you for, I liked the careful and the the common ground there with pastors to unpack something really slowly and carefully. That was great. And it is it is kind of disruptive, honestly, to hear that the way that something is crafted with that intentionality to say, let's use a word, let's use healthcare provider because it's so broad. And let's use these definitions that really open the door for a lot to come in and hope that nobody really is doing the careful work that you are to kind of walk through and say, well, wait a second, what does that mean? And what would the implication of that right. be downstream? I want to go back to something you said, because I want to make sure that I heard this clear. You had, you had said that a no vote is typically like no change, right? So that the things right. that are currently true in the state of Florida, that we together as a, as a population in Florida have said, these are the things that are enshrined in law. A no vote would mean no change that those things right. are working and there we, we feel like we've agreed upon a way to to care for women and to honor the dignity of life and that that has been working in Florida. And this mm -hmm. yes vote is, that's the change. So there's a group attempting mm -hmm. to come in and change what has been working. Is that the right, that's, I got that right? That's the right way to think about a yes, no? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes is forever. And I'll tell you something that also, this is one of the benefits of being the difference that one person can make. I'm one person, but I get to work on constitutional amendments. This is the second one that I've gotten to do. I've done plenty of other campaigns, but it means that I get to help change what's in our state constitution, What's which is just a kind of mind-blowing thought, and anyone who helps out in this arena gets to as well. Um, but when something is in the constitution, it means that it can't be changed by legislators. So I believe that Florida has a lot of dignity that's written into our laws, but they regularly change. You know, Florida didn't always have consent for a minor's abortion, um, but it was written by representatives and senators who believed that it should be the way that it is now. But if if they wanted to, they could change it next year. So every year the legislature meets and we can change that. And that's legislation is a conversation where right now we're here, but next year we might be in a different place. When you enshrine something in your constitution, I think there have been 144 constitutional amendments over the years. We, we have some tax policy that lives in our constitution. Only one of those amendments has ever been overturned. So when we say yes is forever, we mean that we're enshrining this in our constitution without the ability to change it. And in Florida, there have been some amendments that the legislature goes in and sort of fixes or cures. But in this amendment, the end is bound by the beginning, where if the legislature, heaven forbid, this is in our constitution, the legislature can't go in and redefine health care provider in a limiting way because the start of this amendment is that no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict. So anything that the legislature would do, any law in existence today or in the future, should this be enshrined, um, would be limited by the amendment. So it's a little bit of a circular reasoning where um, sometimes the sponsors of the amendment will say, well, we're, that's not going to change. Um, but they're 
arguing that this amendment would undo some of Florida's existing laws. So why wouldn't it undo all of the ones that it seems to address? Um, and it's it can't be fixed by the legislature. Whereas if we keep some of these policies at the in the hands of the legislature, we can change them. Even if you don't like them, they could be different in two years or five years. Yeah, no, that's a great distinction for obviously for us in for our audience, for our organization, we have a particular view informed by a particular perspective from our faith that says, hey, the dignity of life, like there is something inherently in in your mother's womb, you were formed, there's an artistry, a poetry to every Mm -hmm. single life, regardless of gender, race, age, stage, like development, there's just this beautiful overwhelming yes to the thouness or c.s lewis would say there's no mere mortals like every life so there's this divine spark of life from the christian perspective that says that life has such inherent dignity that without need to produce something or to prove something life in and of itself is poetry it's the beautiful first initial appearing of God's artistry. So that's our view, right? And so obviously we we would see something like this and be like, okay, no change, a no vote, that makes sense, right? For this. Right. And and me, because this we're in conversation with people who don't necessarily have that same view or that same conviction, I am interested, what how do you respond to somebody who's hearing this and says this sounds like a bad way to craft policy, right? I may disagree or my neighbor or my cousin or my sister may disagree with me because they don't have that same conviction from the Christian faith about the dignity of life. But I'm hearing you say, yes, there's obviously the dignity of life issue, but I'm hearing that just, this is just badly, it's poorly written and it's bad policy. And how would you how would you communicate that to somebody who says, hey, I disagree on the dignity of life issue. I'm a, I'm a choice person, but I'm interested. Why is this bad policy? Yeah, uh, I think I should take you on the road with me because that's an excellent way of putting it. I like to say if you're pro-life, you have to be against Amendment 4. This allows abortion throughout an entire pregnancy. But if you're pro-choice, you should too. You know, a lot of Floridians believe that there comes a time in in pregnancy when abortion should no longer be an option. This amendment wipes away any of those lines and says that the legislature cannot undo that or or bring any common sense to it. Um, So we have seen in other states that have done this, uh, actually in Michigan, the the ACLU sponsored a similar amendment. They sponsored the campaign for it. And in 2022, that amendment got added to their constitution. And then this summer, the Michigan ACLU um, sued the state of Michigan to require taxpayer funding of elective abortion because not having access to your to to taxpayer dollars to pay for an abortion delays your access. Now, the ACLU helped to draft this amendment, and they specifically wrote that no law shall delay. Well, taxpayer funding of elective abortion is something that a lot of people who are pro-choice don't necessarily want their taxpayer dollars going towards, but they understand that fellow taxpayers might have a conscious objection to it, and so they oppose that their neighbor has to pay for something that they don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Taxpayers of... uh, all stripes citizens of the state of Florida generally believe that parents should be involved on a consent level, consenting to their minor daughter's abortion prior to um, that abortion taking place instead of just being notified. We did a focus group and one mom was like, you know, I'm pro-choice and I'd probably be like sitting there with my daughter should she want to go through with an abortion, but I better be asked first. Mm -hmm. So to her, that was just a huge thing that as a pro-choice voter, um, not being able to have that conversation with a child, that impacts the family. It doesn't matter what your stance is on pro-life or pro-choice. And for a long time, the pro-choice side has said that this decision belongs between women and their doctors. And they specifically wrote an amendment without any doctors. Florida's abortion chapter 390 right now uses the word physician more than a hundred times. Healthcare provider does not exist in that statute, in that chapter of law. Uh, So this amendment, the actual full text of the amendment is just 34 words. I'll hold this up. I'm not usually into props, but this is the full, this is the ballot summary that describes it to voters. This underlined portion is the full text of the amendment. The ballot summary describing it to voters is 49 words. It's about a paragraph. 
two sentences. The full text of the amendment is about 34 words. It's shorter because it doesn't have that extra sentence that deceptively says you get to keep parental notification. So it doesn't matter if you're talking to someone who believes in the sanctity of life or doesn't. This is a policy conversation and it's a bad policy conversation. So I like to say if you're pro-life, you have to be against amendment four, but if you're pro-choice, you should too. Yeah, no, that's great. And that's also helpful for all of us who are listening to, again, we're mm-hmm. all in relationship with people who have really different views on so many different issues. And it seems like this is one where obviously, as you just said, if you have a Christian conviction around the dignity of life that says, hey, from conception forward, there's a uniqueness to that and a dignity to that life, then right. obviously this is a no. And then second to that, it's there's the pragmatist who just says like uh no change right like I, i'm not in favor right. of just inventing new regulation or amendments or 34 yeah. word things that exist forever like so you have the dignity yeah. of life obviously a no you have the pragmatist who just says why are we voting on something that's going to possibly create some downstream implications that we didn't think about We're, what we have is working so that's a no And then you have the just bad policy side that says, let's not be sloppy. Let's not be extreme. Let's not write things. No matter what side of an issue we're on, we're not going to allow things like this to just slip through that are poorly written, poorly crafted, because that's not good policy. And if we want a, a, a citizenry that is working and working towards that good of our neighbor and good of all, we've got to be thoughtful and we've got to be careful with the language and the legislation. So I'm hearing no, no, no. Like it just doesn't doesn't matter which way you look at it. Amendment yeah. four is a no, like a clear no. There's one more voice that I want to ask you about before we have to wrap it up. But this idea for us, we, we've worked really hard to say, hey, people have gotten wrong for a long time. When we talk about the dignity of life, we're talking mm-hmm. about, as I said, every single life, right? Regardless of mm-hmm. age, stage, race, all of those lives are, there's no mere mortal, right? Everybody has mm-hmm. that thou dignity of the image of God in their life. And we've worked really hard to say we haven't always thought well or used good legislation or language around women having that dignity Mm -hmm. and enjoying that kind of view in our culture. And people have worked really, really hard to say we've taken great, great strides forward to have a better conversation and view of each other. And we're just nervous. A lot of the messaging around this is that we're going to somehow go backwards or that this is somehow going to impinge or injure the dignity of a woman's right or a woman's life. How do you respond to that when when that's the concern? It's not so much, again, the dignity of life issue from the, the pregnancy or it's the pragmatist or it's the bad policy, but it's somebody who just says, listen, I don't know, but anything that seems to kind of put a governmental control or a governmental oversight over a woman's life. I'm just, I don't want to go backwards in any department. Mm -hmm. So this feels like that. How do you respond to somebody who says, I don't really know much about it. I haven't read the 34 words, but it feels like anything in that ballpark. I just want to push back on it. Yeah. I've gotten the privilege of getting to know uh, a couple of pro-life OBGYNs and doctors and, um, even just general doctors overall, they always refer to uh, when they're treating pregnancy as first patient, second patient, and mom is always first patient. And there's a beautiful attention to, we don't have a second patient without mom. Mm -hmm. So Florida's laws and laws across the country, actually, um, Florida's laws specifically is what I'll speak to. We have and access to abortion throughout an entire pregnancy. And in Florida's laws right now, two physicians have to agree that your life is in danger or if you have, uh, if there's risk of permanent bodily harm to a major bodily function, you have access to abortion because we need mom, mom's first patient. Um, So, but what's also written into that, that's not just generically patient's health. There are specific words outlined in state statute um, that can be broadened or narrowed should Florida decide to change it. But the attention of two doctors, it was crazy to me. Um, I was talking with a group last night and there was no BGYN. And so I got to like 
roll out a couple of the things like you in order to get an abortion in Florida you are evaluated by a doctor and then 24 hours later you are seen by a doctor we are required by state law the OBGYN scope of practice is that abortion in Florida, whether chemical or surgical, you're seen by a doctor and beforehand you're evaluated by a doctor. They're required to receive informed consent, which is different than parental consent. It means if you're a patient, the doctor has to describe to you um, the impact of this procedure. So in Florida's law, we have put a lot of regulations on doctors treating women. And this amendment removes doctors throughout an entire pregnancy where where whatever kind of care you're seeking, you're treated by a healthcare provider. And that to me, right now, doctors give a lot of time and attention to first patient. And this amendment wipes that away in favor of a healthcare provider, which to me seems like enshrining bad medicine. Um, the scope of practice for doctor is really, uh, it, the, the scope of practice for doctors is limited to doctors. Uh, in the case of abortion, um, I've learned a lot of new terms, medical terms in the last year uh, that I never thought I would learn. But this amendment does away with all of that. And it's unusual. A lot of constitutional amendments um, take a lot more care in the writing of it. In the early 2000s, there was a constitutional amendment on the um, humane treatment of pregnant pigs. That amendment alone is about a page and a, and a quarter, and it has six different definitions, including a definition for pig and a definition for person, and then a definition for the pre-birthing period of a pig. Mm -hmm. um, they took care to write into state law how we should treat pregnant pigs, because when the pen is in your hand and you sponsor an amendment, you can write it however you want to. So if if we believe in dignity and women's health care, right now there are a lot. And all of the policies that I just mentioned um, and how often you are seen by a doctor under Florida's current law, all of those have gone away under other states that have passed similar amendments. So we don't know how broad this is. This this amendment will be litigated for years in courts. And one day we will have a definition of health care provider that's set by a judge. But we have to assume that it'll be broad. It would be malpractice not to consider all the possibilities of what that could be. And it's not a lot of dignity. Yeah. Thank you for that. That patient one, patient two, I just am encouraged by that. Uh, I think complexity, sometimes we forget that there is complexity. We use this term commingled, that reality is good and broken and future, and it's all at the same time. And so we live in this complexity of life that has brokenness in it, and we do need to think well about brokenness. And what about the life of a mom? What about a woman's right to to say, my body is going through something and I have other kids and how do I make decisions about my health care? That is that is right. deeply important to think well about it. And so I appreciate you bringing that out because that's beautiful, the complexity of two doctors saying we have two patients. And we just had a conversation mm -hmm. with this young woman, Lyric Gillette from Faces of Choice, and she brings out the voice of the abortion survivor, those, those who have uh, impact, been impacted on that side of this. And to think patient one, patient two, the complexity of that, it, it is a, it's a difficult conversation and a rigorous conversation and to have it enshrined that it's doctors who are with patient one and patient two in that moment. That's the right way to do it. So again, from whether it's a women's mm -hmm. side or a policy side or a pragmatist side or the, the dignity and artistry of life side, it just, it, on all counts, it feels like no on four is the obvious choice and and very clear. So thank you for helping us make sense of it and to think well of it. And right now, I think what I am wondering about is in the last few days of this election cycle, right? You had talked about that movement from 70% to 60%. And it feels like in all of those, like if everybody who just on a dignity of life says no on four, and then the pragmatists come out and say, hey, we are no on four. And the policy side comes out and says, nope, we want better policy. We are no. And the women's health care, women's dignity come, camp says, no, we, we agree. Like, it seems like this broad coalition is coming around this to say, this is bad. No on four. In the last few weeks leading up to the election, what work do we need to be doing to make sure that we see good policy written in an issue as critical as, as what's being discussed in Amendment 4? 
I would say talk first to people you know who are pro-life because you have to vote no on this amendment, but also talk to people you know that are pro-choice. If you know groups, organizations, clubs, um, churches, we have plenty of video resources to go around that are available. We even have a two-minute video of a doctor explaining in English and Spanish um, why this amendment is so harmful and so deeply deceptive. And I would love to send that to you for for play in your churches or to text to your friends. So you can go to our website. We have a shareables page where there are all of these different infographics that you can download to your phone and then share it as your own picture on Facebook or text it to your friends or email it to your friends. Um, I have some folks who tell me they're not on Facebook. And I imagine that if you're listening to a podcast, you you have a Facebook or a social media or at least a smartphone to text it around. So, so if you need to print that graphic, off and mail it in a letter you can do that too yeah that's awesome well thank you for your work thanks for all of the work that you and your team are doing uh thanks for having a conversation that leads with beauty right like at the end of this for us we just think that the appearing of a human life like the beautiful wondrous uh, absolutely incredible gift of life is something that we need to think well about because it's the highest form of God's artistry. And there's a saint, St. Irenaeus says that the glory of God is, he says, man for mankind, the glory of God is hu- the human person fully alive. Mm-hmm. And what a beautiful, yeah. I mean, this is what you are working on. So Sarah, thank you for yeah. all your hard work. We'll put those links in so that people can access the, the website and get the resources, but uh, don't grow weary in the work you're doing. You're doing an awesome thing. And beauty does lead to goodness and help us know what is true. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Zach. I appreciate being on. Thank you for your time and and for spreading this message.